What's going on, guys? Welcome back to another Tuesday live here on Centaur Spirits. My name is Sam Nash Green. I am at Scribe of Spirits. Today I'm joined by a man who, if you're a rum nerd, really needs no introduction. But I'm going to give him one anyway. This man is the brain, really, behind all the rum you see on the table today. Richard Seal is the brain. He's the distiller. He's the rum maker behind Foursquare. And he's a man who would not call himself, correct me if I'm wrong, you would not call yourself a master distiller. You don't use that term. You don't like that term, if I remember correctly. You make well, yeah, I mean, it, it, I mean, yeah, I mean, my, my, like my business card or anything. Yeah, we don't, we don't really have a lot of titles here, but I do think, I think it's just really because, you know, today it's kind of maybe an overused term. So, uh, um, a marketing term. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I'm not going to name a whiskey brand, but there's a whiskey brand where their distiller, their master distiller at the time, stepped down from his role because they wanted him to travel and be a marketing person and not actually be the distillery distilling. Right. Well, it's gone that way in the culinary world where the chefs are never in the kitchen either. Um, yeah, no, I mean, it's just, it's, we've probably spent too much time talking about the term already, but. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's just one of those terms that's now come a little bit um, overused and and abused. So, because it's really meant to be a sort of a a term, kind of you know, um, given by your peers, not really, you know, by not really a self, department. not really a self awarded uh, title. Which in in ninety percent of the cases today, it seems to be, sadly. That would be like yeah, me walking in really hard. I'm saying, 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 i am saying 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 i let me maybe get my volume down a bit. That might solve it. My own volume. How's that? Testing, testing. That works for me. As long as you can still hear me, that's all that matters. Um, so as I was saying, you know, a man who really needs no introduction, the brain is behind Foursquare, and the man kind of behind Real McCoy and Probitas as well, as far as my understanding goes, um, a rum that is so highly sought after and so well loved that your followers might as well be a cult. And I'm starting to include myself in that lineup as someone, you know, who's bought, you know, in the last couple of months, three or four bottles of Foursquare and fallen in love with the category of rum and also, you know, your liquid. Um, and just a quick shout out to our friend, Josh Hodas, who's in the chat, um, who, actually loan me several of the bottles we have on the table today so that we can, you know, dig, do a kind of a deep dive and a fun dive into Forest Road over the years. We have an Imperi, we have a Real McCoy 12-year, we have a single cast Golden Devil, Hereditas, uh, the Shib, and the Detente are mine. Then we have a Velier 2013. So thank you, Mr. Hodas, and thanks for tuning in. Um... Great questions. I love that the questions are already flowing in. Drew G asks, where you're broadcasting from, Richard? Uh, well, from Barbados, but from my, my home. Now, have you been in Barbados the whole time during COVID? Or did you, like, go back to the stage? No, I, you know, I, this, is, um, this is a nice long stretch in which I have not left Barbados, which is very nice. Um, the last time I traveled was February uh, 2020, so... Um, I was planning to slow down, slow down the travel anyway. So um, it's you know not missing too much. I mean, not really. No, I mean you probably would have been at you would have most likely I assume been at Tails again in July. I know we had tried to meet up uh, that last July, but the kind of rum event was a little bit hectic, so I kind of just dipped out of there. <laughs> Hodus asked, where are the puppies? You have doggies and you didn't bring the dogs to say hello? I have eight. Oh my gosh. 
Well, I would love if they would make an appearance before we're done talking today. Um, so let's kind of just dive right into, pardon? That can be arranged. <laughs> I would love it. Let's just dive right into uh, you, actually. Before we even get into the liquid, let's talk about you and your background and how you got started making rum. So it's a family business. And uh, it was always the case I was going to join the family business. Um, but it wasn't necessarily the case I would be involved in rum. Uh, what really sort of tipped it was, so, you know, it's family business, so, you know, you work Christmas and summer, but I sort of officially joined the business in, uh, 93. And, um, uh, in that year, that's when we purchased, you don't have it in front of you, but we purchased the Martin Dorley brand. And this is a very historic, very prestigious brand. So let me just take you a step back. Uh, rum is very much like Scotch whiskey in that you have a historic separation between distiller and blender. And the original brand, brands are blended brands. And I think sometimes not well appreciated how recent some of the distillery brands are in Scotch whiskey. So, you know, my family is, has a, a history as a, you know, merchant blender. Um, as they say, this is very much in rum, case in rum. And contemporary of my great grandfather was Martin Dorley, but uh, for most of their existence, they were a pretty prestigious brand. Probably the first brand ever exported from Barbados. So Barbados, you know, obviously been exporting rum since the 17th century in, in cask, but um, first bottled brand and. Um, that company had merged with another company in 1970, a much larger group. And long story short, Martin Dorley brand was on a large group that was struggling financially. And so they were selling off some, you know, valuable assets. So the brand was on hard times in terms of its volume. It wasn't on hard times in terms of its reputation. And, um, but it certainly was the biggest purchase my, um, family had ever done. And so I joined the company and we make this enormous purchase, as I say, the largest we'd ever done, a uh, more prestigious brand, more famous for its, you know, age runs, which at that time were not very old. Um, and it really changed everything because obviously I, you know, rum became much more important within the company. Uh, so therefore I had to devote more time to it. And then it also opened up two real um, big things, which was one, we, we started to think about export for the first time ever. So they say most of our existence, we are, you know, a small merchant blending house in Barbados. You don't really think about export. And it also then we had to seriously think about building stocks, um, both to the, you know, continue the prestige of the Dorley's brand and of course they export the Dorley's brand. So oh, there's the doggies. Yeah. So needing to build stocks then really led to the, we need to distill our own and build our own stocks. So that led to the purchase of Foursquare uh, in 94 and Foursquare was a very close, was a closed, very old sugar estate that had closed in 1988. Hadn't made rum in over a hundred years, but had closed as making sugar and molasses in 1988. So we purchased that, refurbished that, and was making rum again in 96. So it was really a question of joining the company. And while rum was always special, I don't, I don't want you to underestimate that because uh, as a merchant trader, the rum was kind of always the, the the star of the show or the the pride and place of the company but that was a huge step and so and me doing me joining at that time it sort of made a complete change in direction um for me in terms of how involved i would be in the rum um and as they say the rest is history 
for the people watching and listening who don't necessarily know what a merchant blender is, can you give us a little bit of a description? Well, so today you'd probably sort of the closest thing with what we would call the independent bottlers. But when, when we think of all the famous Scotch whiskey brands, like John Walker and Dewars and Ballantines and Teachers, they're, you know, they were all people. There was, you know, there was a Mr. Ballantine and a Mr. Teacher, and, and they were all independent of any distillery. Um, I think sometimes it's lost today that we forget that spirits were originally an agricultural product. We tend to think of them today as a manufactured product. They really were an agricultural product, and merchant blenders were the way you know their product got to market. And you know many distillery brands. I mean, when you think the first single malt Scotch whiskey brands, nineteen sixty four, is Benfiddich. Now that's not to say they weren't bottled Benfiddich, but the first distillery, yeah, first distillery brand, single malt brand, was done by Charles Grant Gordon, William Grant, was Glenfiddich. Uh, that's, and there are many brands today that have only bottled their own brand within the last 20, 30 years. Wow. And, and so you can see the same mirror in, in rum. So if you think of rum, if you think of one very famous merchant blender, it would have been Jay Ray, Jay Ray and Nephew. But they acquired Appleton in 1917. So pretty well as in anyone's memory, if Jay Ray and Appleton are synonymous. But Jay Ray was originally independent merchant blender, purchased Appleton in 1917. And of course, all of Jay Ray's products come from the Appleton distillery. Uh, another merchant blender, which you would know in the US, of course, would be Fred Myers. And uh, Fred Myers was a very famous legendary brand. In fact, it's a bit sad what's happened to the Myers brand because it, if you visited Jamaica in the 1950s, Myers is probably the most prestigious brand. You would have been able to drink 30 and 40 year old Myers rum in the, in the 50s in Jamaica, all aged and bottled in Jamaica. Now, Myers is, you know, is a shadow of its, its prestigious self. Um, so you had this separation. And if you visited Barbados in the 60s or 70s, you would have seen many uh, merchant blenders. They're all gone. In fact, my family is the last of the traditional uh, merchant blenders, and we still bottle some of the historic brands, but only in Barbados. Um, so Martin Dorley's and RL Seal are the only ones that we sell uh, export, but we bottle some other ones that, that we only sell locally. So RL Seal is not in back for you? Sorry? RL Seal, I assumed it was named after you. No, that was my great grandfather. Gotcha. So yeah, so that's why I say it was a family business. Sorry, I I I'm obviously not going to be aware of which holes in the knowledge you have. So I don't want to bore you, but I also don't, you know. So yeah, so I'm my my the business was started by my great grandfather in the in the twenties. Gotcha. Yeah, no, basically, I don't know anything. I just know that I've fallen in love with liquid and want to learn more about the category. And I'm like, so, well, who but that in a nutshell. Taste with, then, you know, one of the most famous rum makers in the world. One of the best. That in a nutshell is, is why, you know, there's an RL seal on a four square because our histories are independent and our history is a, is a blender from the 1920s. Four square is a sugar estate. It goes right back to the 17th century but was closed, as I said, and it had made rum like most sugar estates in Barbados, but it had made, it stopped making rum in the 19th century. There was a lot of changes in the late 19th century due to taxation and licenses. Gotcha. And, yeah. So it was, it was, it's modern life. Foursquare was as a, a sugar and molasses producer. Okay. Got it. So, uh, let's dive into the liquid now, shall we? Sure. What order do you want to go through? Um, I don't know. because I don't know what you've got there. <laughs> I'll tell you in a second. Drew just asked what you're smoking, and what do you recommend with the RL Seal 10? So this is RNJ 1875, uh, and it is actually a Dom Rep one, so it is one you can get in the States. Um, it's kind of a regular go-to for me, and it will go perfectly fine with RL Seal 10 year old. <laughs> Um, we have the Empery Real McCoy 12. We have a 
11 year uh, Barbados four square distillery, um, 62.5%. Looking to see if there's any, this is from Edition Spirits in Glasgow, Golden Devil. We have the Hereditas, the Shibley, Velier 2013, and then Deton. Oh, wow. So we got, we've got a nice, uh, I mean, you can start if you wanted to sort of start with them. Um, Something, uh, you know, not the cast strength and maybe one of the brand. I mean, you can start with our, the Real McCoy 12. Is that the 40% version or the 46? This is the 46. Good. So, so Real McCoy is a, is a partner brand. And so we have a shareholding in it. It's not our brand. Um, but it's a situation where, you know, we were always open to the idea of working with a potential partner for something like the U.S. market. Because um, Josh just told us it's the Martin Kate Smuggler's Cove selection. Excellent, excellent. So we were, we were approached with, by the group that founded Real McCoy. And they, the wonderful story about with them is they sort of came with a backstory because of, you know, the heritage of Bill McCoy trading Barbados run. So, so I, you know, I get approached as you might guess to do all kinds of crazy things. You know, I, I wish I had a, a dollar for every spice rum <laughs> recipe I've been offered. You know, everyone says they've got the greatest new recipe ever. Um, but the, the beauty of the real McCoy guys is they say, well, we need to have a very legit Barbados rum because that's our story. So I said, okay, I can do that. Um, <laughs> and so we started with the real McCoy five year, which was, you know, in five years, kind of a sort of very classic in the zone of age, Barbados rum, you know, not everyone in Barbados will drink the, you know, the, the more expensive older stuff. And then we did do the edition of the real McCoy 12. And then we did the special editions for various bars at 46, which is much more agreeable. So. So the Real Mogoy really kind of represents a pretty classic Barbadian style rum. Kind of, that's literally the kind of rum that, you know, the average Barbadian will be drinking. Average rum loving Barbadian will drink a rum very much in this style. It's light, kind of a buttered popcorn note to it. So it's a pot column blend. And that's really become the modern Barbados style. And when I say modern, I mean the last hundred plus years. Um, the advent of the column still was just as disruptive in rum as it was in Scotch whiskey. And places like Barbados, we never swapped one for the other. What we did was is we blended. And it may have been, um, there's some evidence to suggest that the knowledge of, of the idea of blending them came, went from Barbados to Scotland rather from Scotland the other way around. But certainly that's what Barbadian blenders then evolved to. Um, and so it's very different from say the Spanish uh, speaking territories where they tend to be 100% column uh, rums, whereas Barbados always retained, um, if you might say this link with the past, of pot still being an essential or, well, basically an indispensable component of a rum. So the pot, the column still was never able to absolutely replace the pot still. Interesting. Even though you can do more distillation, quote unquote, you know, be continuous, the pot still, you know, that kind of more heavy, unctuous, if you will, distill it, just stuck around. It was just a big popular thing. Sorry, it, it, you were saying, I'm saying, you know, about the call still not replacing, but kind of being blended. Yeah. Was it partly because of the fact that, you know, pot still the more heavy? Yes. More in other words, when the column still came in, it was it was very, very popular. And of course, it was very promoted as, you know, cleaner and and, you know, more pure. And these kind of words were thrown thrown around in early advertising. And yeah, I mean, it, people really gravitated to the easy palatability of 
of the, the lighter column still rum. So, I mean, you know, you can make heavy rums in a column still too, but in Barbados, the column still was generally used to make the lighter rum and leave in the heavier rum from the pot still. And it's the, it's the, it's the mirror of blended Scotch whiskey. Uh, it's the same principle. So you come in, you blend, you can make more of it. It ages easier. It's palatable. It's agreeable. It's, it has a broad appeal. And so, it, yeah, it was, it really changed the, much as it, it was a revolution in Scotland, it was also pretty well a revolution in Barbados as well. Making blending, gotcha. in other words, moving from 100% pot still to blended products. Okay. Sorry, I'm, I'm just, I'm trying to wrap my head around this right now, which is if I go silent because I'm thinking and trying to process what you're saying. Um, yeah, no, that makes sense. You know, the blend, it's kind of, if you will, for lack of a better term, a medium type distill it then, you know, if you think about it uh, with, you know, pot still being that, you know, heavier flavor and column still typically, like you said, being more. But there, there, there's, there's one very important distinction in rum versus Scotch whiskey. And I think it's Please. really very relevant today is that m most, so blended rum is uncommon in the rum world, certainly by volume. There's only a handful of producing countries doing blended rum. Barbados is one, Jamaica is another obvious one. Um, but all the blended rum producers have their own column still. So, you know, with blended whiskey, there's really only a handful of very large green whiskey distilleries. So, you know, without too much disrespect to my Scotch whiskey friends, I do think grain whiskey has become a little generic. Whereas in rum, yeah. whereas in rum, you know, Mount Gay has their own column still. We have our own column still. Appleton has their own column still. So this is why we write those words single blended. So it's blended, pot and column, but it's single blended from a single distillery. And that's pretty special. And that's really, okay. I mean, you know, the, the, it's, that's very uncommon outside of rum. Yeah, no, I've, again, since you, since you know my background again is whiskey, I'm trying to compare that in whiskey. I'm thinking like, okay, there's blended, there's this blended, that, there's this, this and like, there is no such thing as single blended, you know. Theoretically speaking, it could be done, you know, somewhere like Loch Lomond has right. you no... Know, grain and malt distillate. And then I and think Middleton over in blended. Ireland has. And, but yeah. whereas it's the norm in rum with the blended producers, so you think of another blended producer like St. Lucia, they have their own column still. So it's not a case where the blended rums are pulling from different estates and then only having to choose a sort of a handful of, of column spirit. It's all individual. And I think that's a great distinction. And I think that's why blended rums will always be, um, you know, on the forefront with in the in the rum category. They will always mix it up with the pure pure pot still rums because of the because of the uniqueness of our individual column stills. There it is, right on the bloody label, right in front of my eyes. Single blended rum. No. It was interesting. I've had Rio Koya a handful of times before. You know, we had a gentleman on here who used to represent them, Nathan Hazard, uh, and I never noticed that on the label. And that's fine. I mean, as you probably know, there's loads of people out there who drink many fine spirits and they don't necessarily know every detail. And it's really a question of you know your own enthusiasm, how how deep you 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 drill. And, you know, probably for 80% of drinkers in any category, they, they probably know very little, and that's fine. Um, but for us enthusiasts who like to, um, you know, uncover layers and layers of interest, then, you know, as we dig, we'll find these things out. Now, here's a random-ish question. Looking over the label for Rio McCoy, it says heavy char American oak, but a yeah. lot of other brands, other bottlings from that come out of the Forster Distillery Specify X bourbon. Yeah, um, it's, the, have it's a good the same. Of that's just marketing. The, so I don't really control everything with the with the Real McCoy's boys, but <laughs> basically, it's the same X bourbon barrels 
which do have a heavy char. So they're not gotcha. wrong. Because most it's people see of, uh, American oak and they do not think at bourbon. They think, you know, heavy char, new American oak, for instance. Yeah. So, so, so the brand obviously has it more in a sort of marketing style and the four square label has it in a more sort of dry factual style. <laughs> <laughs> Look, you know, if we're, look, if we're comparing factual styles and labels, you know, the Foursquare label is just very much direct to the point, nothing fancy, no picture of you, no, you know, fancy story necessarily. Yeah, no, there's no story in the back of this bottle. Look at the Hereditas, and it's just talking about the liquid itself. There's no story. It's yeah. not like, well, we make this from, you know, this and this and this. It's like, look, this is the type of cult, this is the type of whisk, this is the type of rum it is. To blend of this, and, it, and, it, and it's this. you know, and, it, and it's your audience. You know, the the four squares are a small runs. You know, the audience that buys them are pretty enthusiastic. They kind of they're the kind of people who drill behind the label anyway. So there's no point packing the label with too much stuff. And um, exactly. you know, and then you know, you know, brands like Real McCoy they have to operate in the real world, and in the real world, you 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 have to be a little more seductive than the dry four square label. <laughs> One of the things I've noticed that I want to commend you on, if I may, I don't know if it's just this past year, but, you know, ever since I started getting into Foursquare, uh, I've been paying attention more and more to the rum groups. And for someone who is so well-known and busy making rum, you are so there and active and engaged with the community, always answering questions and, you know, discussing things. And actually, you know, we're going to get into that. We're going to get into GIs in a few minutes. You know, I know you're we were talking about that just briefly before we started about another brand that, you know, doesn't need to be named, but, you know, they don't want the new GI for Barbados. And, you know, we were just talking about that and how you're, my point was that you're so engaged with the community and there to answer questions, you know, yes, people will drill behind the label, but also, you know, I know I've posted things and you've answered and, you know, explained things to me. You know, we had that conversation a few weeks ago with our friend Nicholas King from the WSCT about yes, sharing yes. tasks. yes. So, yeah, I mean, I think, you know, social media is obviously a, another sort of revolution in communication. You know, we forget today, for example, you know, the arrival of radio was a revolution in communication and, and the TV and <laughs> social media. And when smartphones were brand new, when the iPhone was just launched, you didn't even have apps. You had like little web apps that you have to log into, like you go to the browser for. And I mean, actually, and, and before even the social media now, we can even think before to, you know, brand websites. That was, a you know, the next sort of step after in terms of communication. And one of the things I always felt was that even though it was a new media, they tended to use the new media in the exact same way. So, you know, you go to a brand website or you go to a brand for um Facebook page or Instagram and you know it's just pictures of cocktails and recipes and you know pictures of beautiful sunsets and it's just well we'll just use the media for the same type of communication and I just you know it's kind of ironic because I never went on Facebook for a personal account but I just suddenly found that I could communicate with people who wanted to know more about rum and um, so we've always made the social media about um, yeah, about reaching people and asking questions, um, and 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 of course that makes a difference for us because we're you know we're small, so and you know it, it it also comes back to you know the most important thing in any kind of communication is really reaching your audience. So you know you can go on radio or TV or whatever, and you know eighty percent of the people you're talking to are not even interested. The beautiful thing about social media and, and, you know, having a Facebook page and and going to a Facebook group or whatever, you're talking to the people who you're targeting your people. You're targeting your audience. You're speaking to your audience. So Absolutely. you're talking to the folks who want to know more, the people who are going to be yeah, buying Yeah, you're talking to people product. who are actually buying your product or interested in your So, you know, it, it works that way. So it's hyper direct, uh, you know if you will, marketing, it's hyper-direct. Literally, like you're saying, the people who you want to be talking to, your people, those and, people, and, and, you know. it, and it's an extension of a little bit what, of what we were doing physically. In other words, let me explain. So we're a family business, so one of, one of the advantages we have, of course, is that you can, in any family business, you think of any, uh, you know, sort of artisanal product, the ability to talk direct to, to, to the producers is, is a great asset. So, you know, even before 
the sort of widespread social media, you know, we would, you know, I would do master classes in bars and things like this. And so we always saw it was an advantage of, of reaching out to people and, and sort of, you know, touching them directly. And so social media has really just been allowed to be an, you know, an extension of that. And yeah, it's quite funny because, you know, people will message, you know, me, well, before when it was like, a, I had a, a, a Foursquare um, account and, you know, people would message it or my, or they'd message it. Now I have a Foursquare, but I'll say now nah, it's been a few years now. And they'll message and they'll ask me questions. And then sometimes they'll say something like, wait, am I speaking to Richard Seal? And it's like, yeah. <laughs> so they're just so used to that they'll be speaking to, you know, some, you know, person along the line in the company. But no, you're speaking to me. There's a new bourbon out called Blue Run. And I connect with them over Instagram. And I was talking with them, just, you know, chatting and, you know, having a good conversation, talking about whiskey and bourbon. I was talking to the freaking, like, I think he's the CEO of the company, Mike. And I'm like, well, shit, I thought I was talking to somebody in the marketing department. It's a pleasure to meet you, man. Yeah. So I think any, any you know, I think it's sensible to take advantage of the reach of social media to that you can touch your customer. You can reach Absolutely. them. Absolutely. You know, back to, you know, doing master classes, actually. I hadn't planned this when we scheduled today's date. But looking back through Facebook memories, um, four years ago to the day, I attended a Don Ku seminar with Richard Sarayas right here in L.A. He was in L.A. and we tasted Roberto. Him. Yeah, Richard great guy. Sarayas. Yeah, thank you. Not Richard, Roberto. Very nice gentleman. Very nice guy. And we had a great conversation. You know, they had classes scheduled at the same time across the states. And, you know, we were lucky enough to be the state to actually got him in person instead of, you know, like a video seminar or like, you know, a local representative. And, you know, there's nothing wrong with the local teams ever at all. You know, obviously, you know, uh, for Foursquare, you guys work with Altamar and distributed by RNDC. But, you know, there's something to be said about having the producers there. Yeah. Talking to you, answering questions. I mean, I, well, you know, it ha and it has to be right. Like Roberto is a great ambassador for his brand because, again, he's he's in the thick of it. So it's, you know... I don't know if everyone can do it, but he's a great example of someone that can do it. Exactly. And, you know, that's what I respect is someone who, and like you said, it's not for everybody. And not every small brand can do it. And, you know, there are even some big brands that did it for a while, you know, Bullet Bourbon, when they were, you know, just fresh on the scene. You had Tom Bullet there, you know, talking about his bourbon and, you know, presenting at whiskey shows and trade shows. I met the gentleman who founded Tin Cup Whiskey last year in New York at a whiskey show. And, you know, I'm always appreciative to meet people who make the liquid, you know, because it's so much fun to geek out and like, all right, what about this? And well, this, and let's try, let's start with this. And, you know, how did you do this? And why did you settle on this? And this, and the yeast strain and the mash, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. <laughs> oh. What should we go to next? So we had the real um, here. So that was a good representation of a brand. I think we should go to Detente next. Detente? Okay. Yeah. Because we're staying in a reasonable zone of strength. So that's 51. But then we're going to divert into the use of some different barrels. So there's port barrels involved there. I was sipping on this last night. We'll actually be a complete nerd, nerd and playing some World of Warcraft. So again, the you can the, the the similarity in Scotch whiskey in the sense that rum has always traditionally used refill casks. Um, now we would buy new oak staves as well, but we'd always refill them. And and you you know the reason with with, with Scotch and rum is very similar because we don't have ready access to forests. Um, so right. the, the history is refill whereas you know you look at something like bourbon its history is tied to the availability of loads of fresh american oak or if you look at cognac of french oak new french oak whereas, yeah whereas you look at so and i think this is very important for spirits culture because you know a scotch whiskey age in a sherry cast is as authentic a scotch whiskey as could be but a bourbon age in a sherry cast to my mind is no longer a bourbon it can still be well, whiskey speaking as well it's not a bourbon Right, because it's, it's not really part of the, part of the product, culture. The DSS is still spirit it, specialty, 
Um, for those of you guys listening and watching who don't know, uh, the laws for bourbon, the ABCs, if you will, basically say that bourbon can only ever be aged right. in a new charred oak container. Yeah. Um, it actually specifies container, by the way, not barrel. Obviously, Richard, I'm sure yeah. you know that already. <laughs> if you didn't, I'd be a little concerned. <laughs> um, and when you put it in a secondary barrel for a, if it's not another new charred oak barrel, uh, it's legally no longer considered a bourbon. It is now a right. bourbon whiskey finished in blah 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 mezcal or tequila or you know. And I, and I think that's a very, I think that's a very important statement because it's it's about identity. It doesn't mean you can't do it. It just means you respect the culture of this identity, and the culture of this identity says new charred oak. Whereas with rum and, and scotch, this our identity is about you know, those imported port when in the days when, you know, things like port and sherry all came in casks and in bottle, you reused those casks. So, you know, rum has been aged in things like port and Madeira barrels <laughs> for four hundred years. So now let's talk about please go ahead. So Detente is a blend of ten year old rums and they're either ten years in ex bourbon or they're double matured, four years ex bourbon, six years ex port. So gotcha. one of the things I hope you grasp from that is, is that we're not using barrels for finishing. Um, for me, finishing is a bit gimmicky. Um, I don't really take it seriously. If I purchase a very good cask, I want to use it for a very long time because that's aging. Maturation is a very slow process. It's very hard for me to take it very seriously if it's not done for an extended time because the process is very slow. So we do a lot of um, single maturations in casts other than American oak, uh, most famously Madeira casts, and we do double maturations. So, uh, and in this case is a blend of single and double, ma double matured rums. And this, so with the Four Square series, we do uh, the vintages and what's known as the green series as cast strength. But we do the red series. The red series is meant to be kind of the more friendly, a little more accessible, maybe a little more fun uh, series. So that one is not done at cast strength. Actually, in 51 is actually the highest we've, we've done that one in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, and, and we know Poor is again another really popular uh, cask and so it was really perfect to do in the red series of Etant. Uh, so, and the so name Etant is to, is to reflect that this rum is very much, this is the kind of rum you would have your friends over. You know, maybe Shibboleth or Empery, you might keep that to yourself, but Detente, <laughs> you, you know, this is the one you want to have some friends over or, you know, Detente is a good, you know, maybe you're having a, a discussion on something or debate or something. Well, a few bottles of detente. I'm sure you'll be agreeing to everything by the end of the evening. How do you feel about detente daiquiris? Sorry, detente daiquiris. How do you feel about detente daiquiris? How do you feel about putting your detente in a daiquiri? Well, you can put a detente in a daiquiri, no problem. I'm not. I haven't done it, but uh, you're most welcome. That's what I was hoping to hear. You know. I am a big believer of <coughs> good spirits make good cocktails, better spirits, right. better cocktails. Absolutely. Um, coming back real quick, you know, you talked about sherry and port and Madeira formerly coming in casks. You know, I wanted to just touch on that a little bit because we did talk, like I mentioned, that um, we had the conversation. So how old are the casks that you're using the export and ex sherry and ex Madeira. Yeah, well, that, so that's a good, great question because it's a great question in context of the sherry cast. So one of the things that that sometimes people are misled in believing when they hear sherry cast is that the sherry cast come out of a Solera. No, they don't. So histo historically, the sherry cast in Scotland were sherry were cast for shipping, so they weren't very old. And today, most sherry casts on the market would be what you would call a seasoned cast. So the cast is made, it's seasoned with sherry, 
for a couple of years and then sold and the sherry may not end up being sold as sherry the sherry may go off and make vinegar or whatever the the the, the, the purpose it was purely to make a sherry cask. Now there's lots of variations on that. So one of the sherry casks that we typically use would be older wine casks, which are then seasoned in sherry by the cooperage and then sold as an ex-sherry cask. And that's sold as a legit ex-sherry cask. Very rarely it is possible to get an ex Solera uh, sherry cask. Uh, we, cast, we, you know, I had this discussion partly with Lucas Paya the other day, the CSWS National Agriculture for Health and So, so and we have we just brought nineteen of those. So those nineteen are about forty to fifty years old. <laughs> but they've had Sherry their entire life, right? Correct. Whereas we also would buy regularly some uh, sherry punchins that had been used in different wineries and then purchased by the cooperage, seasoned with sherry for two or three years, and then sold as an ex sherry cask. So and they're not as old. They're about you know, 10 years or so, two, three years in sherry, this kind of thing. Gotcha. Yeah. So and there's, you know, but you can also buy new, Madeira, you can buy a new, well. you, you can buy a new American oak cast that was seasoned in sherry for two years. And that's an ex-sherry cast, but it was, it was, it was manufactured as a sherry cast for spirit making. If that makes any sense. Right. They never, yeah. in other words, it never actually made any sherry. Right. It just, you know, it had sherry put into it. Uh, just so it could get that flavor barely. That season in the wood, yes. yes. Yeah. And that's what, and, and, and I think, I think sometimes when you hear this, you know, flavor, flavor, and, and, and yes, as I say, when, when people do finishing, there is a, there's a sort of a, it's hard for me to take seriously because there's a, this, this kind of sense. So maybe while it was just about, you know, because there was five liters of sherry in the, floating around the cast, so therefore you put it in and you want to get it out as fast as you can because all the effect of the sherry is right away. Whereas what we're trying to do is really to get the effect of the wood, so of course we're going much longer. And the thing is to understand is, yeah, the sherry will season the wood. It's not just the sherry flowing around or whatever you had in the bourbon, the cognac. And, and, you think of, and when you think of American whiskey producers, they too also season, but they have to air season. So when you think of staves, you know, air season two years before they're made into cast. It's all about season in the wood. And so when you come now and you, you know, have a sherry cast and it's, it, the wood is, is, it's a seasoning and the time is working for you as well. Um, I did see one question earlier up here. Um, is there something that you do now you wish you did earlier? And that was I was really looking forward question. to getting you this question. I was waiting to get to this question. I'm glad you brought it up. And one of the things I wish I'd done earlier, and this is the rechar and and of of casts. So this is where we take really old ex bourbon casts, shave them, and rechar them. And so the the amazing thing about this is that this cask is better than a brand new cask because you're taking wood that is 20 plus years old or 15 to 20 years old, it's had bourbon in it for the first couple of years, it's had rum in it for the next 10, 15 years. Yes, it's all empty now. You're gonna shave it, so you're gonna come into some new wood, but the fact that it's had spirit in it for 20 years, it still plays influence even in the wood that you've cut freshly into. Of course, and you know, I don't have a barrel is, at easy access, but if you think about it, that what, what you know, American whiskey makers are actually called the red line. If you look at, if you think about the barrel from the inside out, even if you shave and then rechar, that red line is still close to the outer, outside of the barrel, outside of the cask. So you're going to lose, you know, maybe an inch or two of wood. But Not even so much. Yeah, exactly. Thank you. 
you know, but you're still going to have all that flavor and all that liquid that's right. So, so when that here. charring process is finished, the aroma of the cast is unbelievable. Um, and it's better. And of course, what you're doing is you're really creating a, something, a very, very special cast, because this is a cast that took effectively years in the making. Because this wasn't a case that, you know, you went and, and, and you know, cut down the tree and, and air seasoned it for a year or two, three years, and then, you know, charred it. I mean, this is a cast that's, you know, as I say, we'll do cast up, you know, we've done cast up to 20 years old. And yes, this is a process. And the reason why I particularly say I wish I could do it is because we kept putting it off. Um, we kept thinking about it. We kept getting, you know, we, we, we. We, we wanted to do it like, you know, 10 years ago and, and, and we dragged it out and we dragged it out. And then, um, and then even then I invested in the, in the de-charring and the shaving. And then I sort of let the project lie down for a little bit before I, I really got into it. And then, and then we find, you know, sort of, it was something that we sort of were going to do for years. And then when we finally did it, it was like, oh my God, we should have been doing this. We should have been doing this 10 years ago. This is really, really good. <laughs> um, you know, I saw you before we went live today. There was a great question in one of the rum groups that was asking, does charcoal filtration have any, you know, chemical effect on the rum? And you were talking about how it filters out some of those nasty uh flavor compounds. Can you just give us a little bit more detail on that? Yeah, so charcoal filtration is really old, and I think it's, um, in rum, it's associated with color removal, and so you hear a lot of negative comments, especially people who don't know what they're talking about. Um, you know, talking about, oh, it's charcoal flavor, you're removing flavor, and they really have no idea what they're talking about. Um, charcoal filtration, of course, became popular in American whiskey because when American whiskey is done, as you know, in column stills. And the thing about column stills yeah. is they don't get the contact time. You don't get the contact time as a pot distill distillation, the copper contact time. And so I think, you know, early American wh whiskey uh, distillers, and certainly, you know, you can read that some early American whiskey wasn't that great. And I suspect it was a lot related to, you know, early column stills. And... You can read, you know, and learn that these guys tried charcoal filtration and found it did wonders. And it's absolutely uh, no reason not to believe that. And, of course, in rum, famously, uh, McCarty did charcoal filtration. And, but it's, it's even older than that. We have a reference to charcoal filtration in Barbados in 1860. Uh, so again, and it's, it's, it's speaking about, you know, taking the freshly distilled spirit and running it through charcoal. And really what's happening is, is that distillation doesn't do a good job of separating out some organic sulfur compounds, which have, uh, boiling points very close to alcohol. And so they're not well separated and not easily to get them out in their heads and the tails. And so what you find is... You run your new make spirit through the charcoal, and it improves it. The other thing is is that the charring in in, in a char barrel. That's one of the things it's doing. So you know, a barrel is doing about that. Yeah, I mean, I mean, a barrel is doing three things broadly speaking. It's you know allowing uh, you know it's breathing, so it's allowing the oxidative reactions to take place. And of course, we know we're subtracting from the wood. But sometimes um, not enough attention goes to the fact that the barrel also absorbs from the spirit. And, and some of what the barrel absorbs uh, is some pretty unpleasant stuff. And you do associate charcoal filtration a lot with vodka. And the reason, again, there is pretty simple. When you have a you, you know, neutral spirit plant that's making this you know, basically pure alcohol, the one thing this massive multi-column alcohol plant does not do well is remove some of these sulfury compounds. So if you have a, a feed stock into making vodka that is make sulfury compounds and you run it through and it may come out at you know perfectly 90%, 96% alcohol and you know almost you know no congeners, but it may stink. 
<laughs> because of the sulfur. <laughs> And then you run it through the charcoal and it takes care of that. I mean, I did have a scenario, you know, we do real McCoy three or all this charcoal filter. And I had a group come and one of the sort of, you know, bartender visits and they sort of said to me, Oh, but we want to taste the unfiltered one. And I said, I promise you that the filter one's better. No, no, we want to taste the unfiltered one. So I gave them a taste of the unfiltered one. And they were like, oh, yeah, you're right. The filter went. <laughs> I'm not going to lie, to be honest with you. I would also be like, well, can I try the unfiltered one? I wouldn't doubt you that it was better, but I'd be like, well, I'm curious. I'd love to try it. Can I try it? And the reason why it, it, it's better in the case of the Real McCoy 3 is because there's a couple of factors going on. One, we have a fairly young spirit. We also have a fairly light spirit, so Rimokoi 3 is going to use in cocktails and stuff, so we're not, you know, we're not, you know, huge in rum flavor. So therefore, any little off flavor, any little sulfury compound is going to be more noticeable. And we produce Rimokoi 3 in older barrels, so they're not, the charring is not as, have as big an effect. And we want to do that in our older barrels because, again, we want this very light spirit, we want this very, really great for cocktail making spirit, so we choose these more seasoned barrels. So, of course, one of the things that we miss out on is we miss out on some of that effect, that absorption effect of the barrels. So when we take that rum and we give it a charcoal filtration, yes, it will lighten the color, which is, again, what the cocktail guys want for when they want a clear spirit. You know, if, if your recipe wants a clear spirit, you so the charcoal filtration is giving you that. But it's also giving you a much rounder, nicer, um, more pleasant, more, you know, and kind of the fruit and stuff is more more prominent uh so yeah that's why when the when the guys tasted the filtered one they were like oh yeah this is much better way better for my cocktail <laughs> so you know it's one of these things that that it's got a negative thing charcoal filtration and it's really sad because charcoal filtration has been around in spirit making for 200 years nearly as known as for improving the quality of spirit Fair enough. No, that makes sense, you know. On a chemical level, even Jack Daniels acknowledges that, even the, you know, the TTB acknowledges that the charcoal metal and charcoal filtration that Jack Daniels does has a chemical change in the spirit. So that's why they can call it Tennessee whiskey. That's at least part of that is, is that's part of the answer. You know, I don't remember the exact information. It's been a while since I've had to bring that up. But, you know, it's literally a, partly on a chemical level. And, you know, like you were saying, it removes some of the sulfury compounds that don't taste good. Yeah. And as you say, you know, to, to say you don't like charcoal filtration, well, uh, you know, as every, every single charred American oak spirit has got a form of charcoal filtration. Uh, Chris just asked a really good question. He said they were in Paris. He said he was in Paris a few weeks ago. Someone working in a rum shop told him four quit isn't popular there be there's an English style rum. He said, which confused him because Barbados and Jamaican rums are so vastly different. Is there an English style or is he just being a pain in the ass? No, I think it's more of a flip side. Um, there's a very distinct French style, and obviously, and and for sure, the 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 you know the French agricultural rums are more more popular in in France. I mean, like anything else, the world is appreciating more and more diversity. So you know, we do better in 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 France than you know we did twenty years ago. Um, but for sure, I mean, uh, you know, the the the, the French rum is still. Is still king in France, you know. So I think, so I think it, it, it's that context. So I imagine this shop was probably selling loads more, you know, Nissan or something like this, and 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 GM and Clement, and, and that's fine. I mean, they're all brilliant, brilliant brands. So it's just context, really. Speaking of English, English I'm going to use that as a very forced segue. Uh, to see if you want to move on to one of the UK releases. We have the Golden Devil, we have the Empery, or no, Empery I think was America. Yeah, Empery was America, and then Hereditas was the English variant. 
Well, we can do, um, let's do, let's do Empery. So in Empery, we're with the Green Series, and we are, um, uh, and now we are with uh, Sherry Gas. So, so what else we've we got? Mine, we got Dayton, we've got Empery, we've got Hereditas. What's the other one we got? Shibboleth. Uh, we got the Shibboleth, which we, I think we did Shibboleth already, right? No, no. we didn't. I was drinking no. some earlier. We also have this. 2013 Habitation yep, Valley. That's pretty, right. That's a very special, very different one. Artisan pot still. Yeah. Um, two year old, sugar free, natural color, aged in the tropics, sixty four percent ABV. Oh man, I'm looking forward to trying that. <laughs> that's very different. That's gonna be very different. Actually, that's gonna be a bit of a shocker after these old ones, but never mind. So we can do um umpery next. Umpery. Yeah. Um, Chris said he asked, but the guy just gave him a dirty look. Well, you know what, Chris? If you're giving a dirty look, it's not the shot for you. Having worked in liquor retail, uh, I would do my best to educate the people who would walk in, would want bottles, be it rum, whiskey, you know, agave, Spirits, or you know, wine wasn't my thing, so I turned over to my coworkers. But you know, if they're talking down to you, they're giving you nasty looks for asking questions. Take your money elsewhere, man. There's so many great shops, you know, that focus on high quality niche spirits, especially in the UK and you know the EU. Even uh, screw that place. Oh wow! What the fuck? So Embry, so we're now going into our first cast strength because we did Rimokoi twelve forty six. We did the fifty one. We did uh, yeah. So we now doing Embry uh, and Embry is Embry is God. I can't remember now. I got too many releases. What was Embry fifty six? <laughs> 56, yeah. Yeah, ah, I'm remembering well. See, there you go. Mark nine of your exceptional cask selection. So, Embry is in the Green Series, and it is um, 14 years old. Again, like Dayton, it's a blend. So, there's 14 year ex bourbon rums in there, and then there are double matured bourbon and sherry rums in there. And if memory serves me right, I think it's 10 plus 4. Is it 10 plus 4 or was it 4 plus 10? I can't remember, to be honest with you. <laughs> Ember was released a couple years too ago. Much rum? Yeah, it's too many releases. But it's a double, it's a single and double matured uh, blend. Mm. Um, Speaking of a lot of releases, Meredith has a great question as well. With the recent spike in ECS series demand, has that changed anything for plant production for 10 to 14 years down the line, or simply is everything going according to plan? Yeah, I mean, one of the things that the, 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 the change really in terms of demand has only affected the, has mostly affected the, how fast they sell rather than um, selling more. So, I mean, if you look at, uh, Empery was um, 2,000 cases worldwide, 1,000 for the U.S., and it came That's out in December no, different, so. no different than Dominus before it. Um, and, you know, if you look at the last Green Series, Red Atab, same thing again, 2,000 cases. The difference would be is that how fast the 2,000 cases are selling. Um, so we're not producing a, a, um, that much more. Having said that, we are producing a little bit more. The vintages have been a little bit bigger. Um, we added this year Shibboleth, another 800 cases. So again, not remarkable. So one of the things that we haven't done is really change the real, the, the volume on ECS uh, significantly. Um, and of course, ECS is well within our capacity um, it's still the very small and elite part of what we're doing. Of course, as I always explain to people, it's this, each step of success leads to the next step. So 
you know, when we launched uh, Dorley's XO, you know, in the export market in the early 2000s, it did very well. That allowed the investment to come out with things like Dorley's 12 that allow, you know, the success of that allowed the investment in, in, in later releases and, and the ability to do things like the vintages. And of course, the success of these, we continue to in, invest and, you know, put stocks away, uh, recast. Uh, and so we keep, we keep investing um, uh, for the future. But as you say, it's not like, um, it's not like we're selling a dramatically different amount of ECS. We're keeping it, we're trying to keep it pretty elite and pretty, pretty small. Of course, the downside of that is that we do get more complaints that people can't get a bottle. But it's, it's a, it's you, know, a you have stores yeah. selling a bottle of uh, Shibleth for, you know, $400. Yeah. And the thing with that, like, for example, that case, which you had put out, we never, they not, never got that from our distributor. So it wasn't a case oh, wow. that we could go. Yeah. It wasn't a case that we could go to our distributor and say, well, don't give them any more allocation. One of the things that we're finding is that some retailers will go and buy from other retailers, which is illegal, and then retail yep. in their shop. Um, and that's actually illegal. And the, the, one, of the, one of the problems that we have, of course, is these things are the minority. Um, so it's a very hard problem to solve. Let me give you an illustration. Um, so when Shibboleth came out, 16 in the UK, 16 bottles went on rum, rum auctioneer. Now, if you're a person trying to find one bottle of Shibboleth and you see 16 on rum auctioneer, you're going to be pretty pissed. But when you realize that the allocation for the UK of Shibboleth was 800 bottles and only 16, less than 2%, went to auction, you realize then how hard it is for us. So, in other words, we, we can't be hundred percent perfect in in making sure the bottles don't get to auction. That's not um, even your job. Your job is to produce quality spirit, and you know. I know, but but when I have an upset customer, when I have an upset customer who wants to stop these sixteen bottles going to auction, I then have to try to explain. Well, you know, that's you know, in context. Uh, we've actually done a good job because it's a very small amount. But as they say, you, you, you always have to see things from each person's perspective. So if you're the person trying to get one bottle and you see 16, you're going to be pissed. But 16 in the context of 800, you know, not that bad. I mean, the, 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 it's a genuine difficult situation where there's just simply more, you know, rum's doing better. There are more people drinking rum. There are more people, you know, at all audiences are growing. So, so the audience that loves Foursquare is a growing audience, and it's it's difficult. New addition to that audience. Hi there. <laughs> <laughs> you know, perfect example of wanting a bottle and going to get it is I found Shibleth in Northern California. So I had a friend who lives up there get me the bottles, and then I got it transported down to me and I just got it actually today a couple hours before we started chatting um, or you know other people who I know who will order it from the UK and have it arrive from the UK you know of course they're going through legal shipping avenues because shipping booze is not legal person to person yeah and and then that brings another point it's which is very relevant in the US is of course we have to get our distribution right. So what tends to happen is you have a scenario where, you know, we ship a certain amount of vintage to let's say one market, let's say, you know, New York, for example, and it's too little. So the shelves in New York go dry, but then, you know, there's some shops that still have 2004, you know, out in, you know, some other state. So we have to try and, and balance and make sure that the distribution matches demand, and we don't always get that right. And it's a hard thing to do. You know, one day demand will be higher than the next day. You know, someone may be like, oh, well, I really loved this port cask Foursquare, but 
I'm not a fan of an ex bourbon only cast, so they don't buy those yes, two. Yes, exactly, two and and that's very much the case. So while there's while you see a broad demand for horse square, people have their own personal things. I mean, I've had many people say to me, for example, especially in the in, with American audience, is they'll say, you know, I like the ex bourbon stuff. I don't want any of that wine finished stuff. And of course, it's not a wine finished stuff, but. You know, you don't argue with your customer, right? You just, if <laughs> exorbitant is what they like, then that's what they like, right? You can. Absolutely. But, but for sure, you can have a scenario where some of our fans just, you know, no, I'm, I'm you know, they'll be like, no, I don't like Empery. Give me, you know, give me nobility. Thank you very much. Yeah. Um, now, here's an interesting question talking about. Uh, Hang on, my brain's having a lapse in function. Talking about, you know, cask or secondary cask maturation, um, if you will, not cask finishing. How do you decide what you're going to put it in and what you're going to release? You know, you have two sherry cask matured four square releases right here. You know, the Empery and the Hereditas. Is a detente, which is port, and the shibleth, which is just bourbon. How do you decide what you're going to release? And are you? So, and Josh actually so what we do is 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 the is the yeah. vintage is always which you don't have this evening. The vintage is always ex bourbon, and the reason for that is is that's the core. So I finished my bottle of vintage, and I couldn't find any more. Two thousand eight, and I haven't seen the 09 yet. So the 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 vin the. Ex bourbon is a core of what we do, and that's really kind of the backbone of Barbados Rum. Um, you know, we've been importing American oak from North America for 400 years, but the last 40, 50 years is ex bourbon, and um, and that's really you know obviously the ex bourbon casts are available, and you know for us uh, as I say with long long history of, of American oak, if you know if. if, if, if absolutely you know fits right in with us so that's the backbone so the vintages are that the other two is then when we we sort of step off and do something a little different um so that's really then really what's available i mean the way the rums work is you know it's kind of the rum comes first so you know this year you know at some point i'll be thinking about uh, the successor to red atop and i don't think about it in terms of, oh, I'll do a sherry cast or I'll do a Madeira cast. I look and I see what stocks are coming of age. And then we do, we taste and then we decide. So it's really largely shaped by what I did 12 or 14 years ago. <laughs> uh, because, you know, read a tab, I might want to do a 14 year old. And if I don't have 14 year old aged in sherry, well, the next one will not be a, a sherry cast or a Madeira, you know, it'll depend on what's available. Um, so what you're saying, just so I'm following you, and this leads back to a question Josh Hodes had earlier um, about blending. He said, do you blend, uh, be, do you blend age, do you blend before barreling? So, so we um, blend before barreling. Uh, so our, we always do an initial blend of distillates. And that blend is what we and uh, call a mark. Uh, so the barrel, so you might visit Foursquare and you'll see a barrel, and the barrel will obviously have the, the, the date in which it was filled. You can obviously the, see the type of barrel it is, whether it's a, you know an ex bourbon, and depending on the fills, it will get marked, the barrel itself. So we'll know whether this barrel was immediately filled from Kentucky or if it's a barrel that you know was three years old in rum or whatever. So we can see that on the barrel. And then the other thing that's on the barrel is a little code, which is the mark, which basically says the formulation that went into the barrel. So that's the pre-blending. But then, of course, when we actually then create the final rum, whether it's M3 or Red Tab or whatever, we'll be blending different marks. Uh, so then there'll be the post-blending. Gotcha. Okay, that makes sense. Because I was curious about that as well. It's like, you know, I was wondering whether you were blending it, you know, taking mature rum. And I mean, it wouldn't make sense. So I'm just going to shout out. I'm not even going to finish that statement. Um, so let's talk about the Heredita and comparing it to the Empery, if you don't mind. So, so one of the things I did that year um, was we released 
three rums that were bourbon and cherry. Uh, Heretas, Empery, and Patrimonio. And I remember when I did that, and a couple of people said to me, I'm crazy, including my son, said, no, you can't do that. You can't do all the rums with the same pedigree. And I did it very deliberately, because one of the things about the ECS, you know, obviously, I want you to enjoy the liquid, but part of being drinking these style of rums is, is an education. And one of the things I really love people to move away from is the thinking that you reduce a rum to sort of a laundry list of parameters. And in other words, just because this rum is 10 years in bourbon and four years in sherry, it must taste the same as another rum that I've put 10 years in bourbon and four years in sherry. And a little bit of that comes from the concept of thinking that every day the stills produce the same thing. Um, no, that's where the blending, the pre-blending comes in. So that's where the ability to make different rums from the stills and then blend to create a different mark. So I could have a rum, I could have two rums that are aged purely, let's say, in sherry barrels, but they'll taste very different because of the rum that went in. And so if you want to taste Empery and Hereditas together, you will see, even though their pedigree, if you like, their, their stats are the same, they are different rums. And if you threw Patrimonio in there, you'd see another different rum again. Just going off of color alone here, um, the Empery is much lighter than the Hereditas, which fascinates me, you know, considering they're the same pedigree, obviously, you know, certain barrels, certain, you know, percentages obviously aren't going to be the exact same necessarily. Barrels especially are going to be unique. But just looking at the color, the red has to be so much darker. It's fascinating. And much richer, too. I feel like the Embry shows more of that ex bourbon, and the Hereditas shows more of the sherry cask. And that's because, you know, there are different sherry casks involved. And we've done the sherry casks had different histories. Exactly. You know, that's the thing is obviously, same pedigree, we're comparing the same pedigree. But we're not. So, I, 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 so I, you know, I did that very much. The same release. I did that knowing very much people would compare them, and 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 as I say, it was very interesting how automatically people thought, well, they must be the same release that you've just given two different names to, because they read the pedigree, and and again, people are very conditioned to believing. Like you know, a sherry cast rum is a sherry cast rum or a sherry cast whiskey, but. It really depends on what cask um, and what rum. And um, so we as a producer could produce, release three different 14 year old rums, all using bourbon and sherry casks, but three different rums. And that was, and that was the, and as I say, that was the fun of it because we wanted people to not think of that you can reduce a rum to parameters. This Hereditas is so good. It just got those really nice red fruits, almost a kind of a syrupy sweetness, but not in a bad way. It's just this bottle, if it was still available, would be dangerous for me. Because I would buy, you know, one. Yeah, of the Hereditas is, is very seductive. One. It's a very seductive. Um. But Talking so about like the kind of the whiskey exchange that we, we did that for, he, he, that's what he likes. He likes he likes his spirit to be very, very sweet and seductive and very you know very and very dangerous. Yes. So Kinder has a great palate, I'm sure, and I love what whiskey exchange is doing. I especially love that they April fool everyone by selling them what they thought was a young whiskey and turned out to be thirty year old space eyed single malt scotch. Um, speaking on sherry, though, what type of sherry cask are you using? Currently, we're Oloroso? only we've only been using Oloroso, yeah. Oloroso, okay. Yeah. Any plans for a Fino or a PX or a Manzanilla in the future? Um, you know, one of the reasons why I never did PX is because 
sort of PX got tainted a little bit in rum. It's been associated with all the guys who sort of, you know, put rum in a PX cast and then say, oh, that's where the 40 grams of sugar came from, which, of course, is a lie. Um, but, but yes, I mean, if you put anything in a PX cast, it's going to pick up a little sugar. I mean, you put it in any sweet cast, I mean, it's going to pick up a gram or a half a gram or whatever. I mean, yeah, year. of course. <laughs> So we just kind of, because of, you know, we being sort of um, passionate advocates of not doctoring up rums, um, I describe my four layers of adulteration. Um, so the first layer is fresh out the still, there's no adulteration. The second layer is you use virgin oak. So it is adulterated because you use flavor from the wood, but the wood had no other what thing in it the third level of adulteration is if you use wood that had another spirit so if you use bourbon or cognac or whatever because spirits the the dna if you like of spirits are, are very similar in other words if i showed you an analysis of a, of a whiskey and an analysis of a rum you would you would see they're very very close and then the fourth level of adulteration is when you use a wine cast and that's of course that's when i think you've, you you're no longer a bourbon because you're definitely, uh, you've adulterated your way away from being a bourbon. Um, so, yeah, so, you know, I sort of shied away from PX because um, so many people were using PX to sort of make adulterated rums, and I just thought, why am I even going to play in that? Even if my PX was not going to be an adulterated PX, you know, it was going to be an empty cask, and there was going to be no, sh you know, I just sort of, Oh, well, I'll, I'll just stay away from that that trouble. So we use all our own. But we do use, I mean, the Madeira, it's a sweet Madeira um, port, you know. But again, you, you know, you can test the runs and you will find, you know, if you put it in a port cast by six, seven years, maybe half a gram of sugar, something like that. Not 20. Oh, no, sure. Gram. It definitely adds something to the bricks, though, but it's not going to be insane. Um, two more questions on casks because... I'm annoyingly nerdy and annoying about this one barrel. Um, Mizunara Oak. Anything Mizunara coming out? Have you done experiment with Mizunara before? No. I don't know. I just something about Mizunara just probably marketing hype. But for me, I just love Mizunara Oak. I love seeing Mizunara experimentation in whiskey. And no, I mean, what really working what well. really motivates me with the cast is really the quality of the cask. So what I mean by that is, is I'll use, so the obviously our history is refill, but I'm using refill mainly from primary sources. So people will ask me, would you ever use a Scotch whiskey cask? And I say, no. And the simple reason is, is a Scotch whiskey cask is not a primary cask. Whereas when you go and you buy a cognac cast, that was a primary cast. And cognac, of course, are famous for the quality of their cast. So you go and you buy a sherry cast, you buy a, a Madeira cast. There is our primary cast. So you're buying a cast because of the quality of the cast. One of my favorite sources of a very limited amount of cast is I buy some ex-Chilean wine casts. Because the Chilean Ooh, producer, Chilean wine. yeah, well, the Chilean producer is one of the best producers on the planet of wine. Period. They go over to to the best cooperages in Europe, buy the some of the best French oak casks, which I couldn't afford. They use them for their magnificent Chilean wine. And if then, you can't afford it, it must be really expensive. And then, and then they have them to release, and there's not a lot of demand in Chile for secondary casks. So I go along and I end up with a magnificent French oak cast. And then, of course, I don't and use have it Have you released anything with that yet? No, because I don't use it for finishing. I use it for maturation. So, you know, my oldest in that is 2016. Um, and it's oh, gonna wow. Going. It's going to keep going for so a few more years. Probably another 10, five or 10 years then, huh? Uh, five, yeah, maybe. Oh, yeah, I could release something at 10 years old. But again, and, and that's also not even used for double rate maturation. The fresh rum has gone into that cask. So, you know, we saw that cask out purely because it's an outstanding cask. Yeah. How would you describe Chilean wine or this particular Chilean wine? Um, well, it's, I can tell you it's Montez. It's a beautiful wine. 
Montes is one of the best producers in the world. I don't drink a lot of wine, so. I mostly get from them Syrah cast, because I love their Syrah. And also Syrah is a little, you know, it's not so tannic a wine. It's not so, it's a very soft wine. So I feel more safer with a Syrah cast than, say, a, gotcha. than, say, a, a Cabernet. Having said that, this year I bought some, uh, I bought some Bordeaux cast. I got brave. <laughs> Oh, um, sorry, I'm responding to comments at the same time as listening to you and trying yeah, to Yeah, sure, if you want to talk, talk about. about some of the questions. Uh, do you have any barrels of Just Call Him Still Rum aging? No, I do not. No barrels of Just Call Him Still Still aging. Any plans to make any more Just Call Him Still? No. Okay, nice and easy. Uh, Matt Ellingson asked, how would you describe the personality and attributes of Barbados compared to other rum points of origin? And how do you try to showcase that? So that's a good I question. question. And it, it's a good question. It's hard to put into words, but the thing about rum making, if you sort of looked back, you went back far enough, rum making was have been pretty similar in the island. Certainly pretty, cer certainly pretty similar in Barbados and Jamaica and comment and, uh, and, uh, um, most people think that it was just molasses. No, it, historically it was always molasses and juice. Um, but the world diverged in sort of late 1800s. Um, arrival of column still, arrival of cultured yeast, uh, arrival of central sugar factories making, you know, a more uh, molasses more available, more abundant. So shifting rum formulas to molasses only shifting, making light rums in column stills, cultured yeast, control of flavor. So we've had this sort of revolution that sort of took place in spirit making in the late 1800s. And that's where you, then you get the diversity. That's where Barbados then diverses off from a Jamaican rum. And so Barbados really embrace that lighter style of rum, cultured yeast. And so, to, so today, Barbados is a much, uh, it's a, you know, it's a lighter style. It's a, it's a, a very elegant style. It's very balanced. Um, we don't really like um, any kind of off flavors. We're very intolerant of any kind of sort of strange uh, off flavor. Um, we like it very rounded, uh, very palatable. And and so at Foursquare, we really try to do this. We really try to make rums in the Barbados style. So even when we push the envelope. And, you know, we do do some interesting things with wine casts and cane juice fermentations. Even when we do those things, we still try to, to work in this umbrella. And, and that brings me to an important point that I always try to make. You know, you can make anything different for the sake of making th things different. I think the real challenge is to push the envelope of quality, and, but keep working in the framework. So in other words, the four square rum should always taste like a four square rum. The Barbados rum should always taste like a Barbados rum. Um, I could just make a rum that tasted different for marketing purposes, but I don't want to do that. I, I want to stay true to the style. I want you to recognize. I want like this evening, you're tasting all these four square rums, and I want you to say two things. I want you to say, one, they're different, and two, they also have a common uh, element. Um, so well, almost three things, if I may. You also yeah. want me to say they're good because they are. <laughs> um, yes, that's actually most to, important. You enjoy them, but you you see you I'm see enjoying common, them. You see a common also, style. Also, another shout out to our friend Josh Hodes who's in the chat, who loaned me several of these bottles to taste with you today. Otherwise, it would have just been two: <laughs> the Chib and the Deton. So we can um, go on a shibboleth, and the shibboleth is going to be strikingly different than the sherry cast. I was going to ask, what rum do you want to move on to next? You still have so the Golden Devil, the shibboleth, and the column. So the Golden Devil, the reason why I haven't mentioned the Golden Devil is it's an independent bottled one. I've never not tasted it myself. So I've sort of well, focused on the ones that... that one, then. We've, I focused on the ones, you know, I've bottled. <laughs> so, <laughs> so rum, like Scotch oh, whiskey, has independent bottlers. And so that would have been rum that I would have shipped to Liverpool 
I'm not sure the exact pedigree, but I would have shipped it to Liverpool. Then they would have aged it a bit more in Liverpool. And then Kill Devil would have picked the cask in Liverpool and bottled it. So I have not tasted that rum since it left me many years ago. <laughs> um, <laughs> so there isn't any information on here about it. Just as it's still Barbados, Forsberg Distillery, distilled November 06. Um, one of 214 bottles, clocking in 62.5% ABV, aged 11 years. So um, chances are that was aged eight years at Four Square and three years in Liverpool. That would be my bit, my my guess on the pedigree. But this it, is much softer. Much more. Yeah. So color. what what we tend to ship there is very quintessential of the Barbados style. Uh, all ex bourbon, um, so yeah. I mean, we wouldn't ship to sheer sort of our sort of ones that we maybe shoot off in a different direction. So again, this is kind of a little more. This would be sort of a little more like a cash strength version of the real McCoy sort of thing. Yeah. Okay. Very sweet. I have very, a golden double coming to me through K and L very soon. I'm excited for it to arrive. Yeah. So, so, so it, you know, as I said, I haven't tasted it, but typically what I was saying this year, very sweet, very sort of brown sugar, caramelized uh, sugars. Definitely. Lots of that. Yeah. Very. Not a bad room by, by any means, because not my style. At least this one isn't. But that should be a single cask. Um, going back to casks, though, real quick. Interesting question. And, you know, I'm glad that Josh, I know he pointing him out, but it's because I know him. Uh, quite personally, uh, he brought up. I'm going to ask the Charlie Prince barrel question. Charlie Prince. I'm not sure if you know Richard. Refers to Charlie Prince from Drammers Club. And for those of you guys watching, definitely check out Drammers Club if you are anywhere in the world. I don't guarantee there's a chapter there, but you know, definitely something that you would probably want to start a chapter. Drammers Club is a lot of fun. It's a bunch of booze nerds getting together. And tasting good bottles and sharing good bottles and just enjoying each other's company over a couple hours, you know, once or twice a month. Um, the Charlie Prince barrel question, as he called it, is any plans for an agave barrel? Typically referring to a tequila barrel, but occasionally you know, any plans for a mezcal barrel. So none at all. That um, coming out. So none at all. A couple of reasons. One, there's no real historical uh, association or link. So we try to stick with barrels in which there is an association or a link, even if it's some, sometimes a little tenuous. Um, but so, you know, every barrel that we bring in and refill is a long history of being imported into Barbados. Uh, and secondly, the reason I mentioned earlier is we really search out primary casts. So you're, what you're doing is you're searching out a denomination that's famous for its cast. Um, so again, it's not about searching out, you know, because you want Gabby flavor, it's about searching out the cast. So, you know, tequila is not a primary cast purchaser, you know, they're not you know they're not yeah i was i was thinking about that when he asked that question you're talking about primary cast purchasers the is buying x bourbon barrels you know typically and you know in the case of one or two that you know they use wine casks for finishing even you know maybe a, a slightly secondary maturation but so, so, so it's the same principle applies to scotch whiskey we wouldn't use exactly. a refill of scotch whiskey we wouldn't re reuse a refill of gabby we're really now, on the no. flip side of that, though, have any Scotch whiskeys used X four square barrels? Uh, yes, and this year we have released. Generally, we didn't release casks because refill casks are a very important part of our aging program, and of course our rechar program, which we did finally kick off. But we were always keeping barrels for it anyway because, as I say, we were always going to do it. <laughs> Having done, done, done that, we did some numbers this year. Um, and even though we're building a cooperage this year to scale up our rechar operations, when I did my numbers, I realized I had more cast than I needed. Uh, so we have sold some casts uh, this year, some XRM casts. So you will probably see some whiskey producers in the next 
couple years saying we finished this in a four square cast. So you're gonna allow them to use your name then? Yes. I like I like it's very yeah, it's very limited in what we've done. And um uh you know it's it's possible we could do some more in, in the future. But uh so we did our numbers, you know, we're doing our cooperage, sort of figured out hey, we have more than enough cash for our cooperage. Um we got some excess, we can sell some. On to the shibboleth. Right. So the shibboleth again, um as I say, when you drink ECS, it should be pleasure, but it should also be education. And, you know, one of the things that you hear all the time in rum, which is one of the more nonsensical statements, you know, rum doesn't age or rum, you know, has a sweet spot or rum can't um, age too long or it will get woody or whatever. And, you know, this is really nonsense. Any spirit can age, uh, can age for a long time. Um, the thing to you know if you if, 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 if you've tasted a rum that's very old and you don't like it and you think that it, 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 it you know it's um, bad well then it was badly aged um, you know just don't if something if somebody does something badly it doesn't mean it, it can't be done so one of the beautiful things we've tried to do with Chibboleth is to come out with a 16 year old rum but a very sort of fruit forward really well integrated with the cast. And so the, the rums that we selected for Shibboleth were rums that were specifically put aside to age very long. What we did is we recast them at about 10 years old and recast them into casts that we knew they would really mature really well. And so, you know, we still have more and, and we intend to, we intend to continue to age and release very, very old rums. For me personally in Shibboleth, I get a lot of toasted coconut and burnt marshmallow. It's very creamy as well, very creamy. So it's a, it's a, you know, it like, like if you compare it to nobility, nobility is kind of a little more of the classic fourteen-year-old ex bourbon, you know, very wood forward, really soft, really nice mouthfeel. Uh, whereas Shibboleth, then you think Shibboleth should be like nobility, but we wanted to show something completely different. Now, it's one we don't have here today because I literally only had 10 CL and I drank it and shared it with friends. But the Foursquare Sassafras, what can you talk ah. to us about that a little bit? So Sassafras was 14 years old, three years ex-Bourbon, 11 years ex Kanye. That was so good. I so mean, I had to work to make that last more than a couple of days. So the difference between the Valier series and the ECS series, just to um, please, is yeah, the because series, we have the ECS series here as well as the, Golden Devil McCoy as well as Habitation, but this is a different kind of Valier series. So the Valier series, it's all bottled at us. It's all it's our brand. Everything. I think some people think it's an independent bottling. It's not. Um, it's it's not, the smaller. I even know that. Sorry? I didn't yeah, even know that. that. I thought they bottled yeah. it. Yeah, the only bottle that you have in front of you that we have not bottled is the Kill Devil. All the rest are bottled at us. Um, the the Valier series is the smaller releases. So Sassafras was only 6,000 bottles worldwide. Whereas Shibboleth, which would be one of our smallest ever ECSs, was 9,600 worldwide. And Did Sassafras ever actually come to America? No. And Sassafras actually officially only goes to two countries. But because things move around in the EU much easier, then you 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 can find someone importing Sassafras. So the you know there'll be a Sassafras in the UK and Netherlands or whatever. But yeah, they would have the bought it. They would have bought it from Italy or France. Um, so. So sometimes we lazily say Valier is Europe only. It's actually officially only France and Italy. Um, so quality wise, um, I know people naturally think, well, it must be a higher quality, but it's, it's, it doesn't have to be. It's just a case of if we have a particular release that's very small. And of course, yes, I mean, obviously the very small releases do tend to be very good. 
And so, you know, if you prefer sassafras to everything, then, you know, it's not surprising. But uh, I just, you know, if you prefer the shibboleth to sassafras, that's okay too. Um, but, I can't uh, compare the yeah. two. They're just so vastly different. Yes. I mean, sassafras and shibboleth are very different runs. Yeah. You said sassafras is uh, more than once, one time release? No, it's a uh, it's, uh, one time release. The the thing about sassafras is, is that we released the same rum um, at 10 years old, which was for square 2006. Gotcha. And then sassafras is, I mean, it's not exactly the same barrels, but it's the same rum, um, but the same pedigree. Uh, I had the Bellier. pleasure of trying it thanks to the Bellier Great Small Bottles, or Small Great Bottles. Yeah. Anyway, that's how I was able to try it. Yeah. After much hassle finding an importer for the U.S., I was finally able to get a bottle. Yeah, so officially, no, it's not. A, Ten CL. The fact that the U.S. now allows 700 means it's possible we could have an allocation in the U.S. in the future, but you still have the hurdle of TTB and state registrations and so uh, that's why yeah. it's always much easier when you have something that's very small it's much easier to do it in europe i know my american friends hate to hear me say that but there's a lot of yeah, overhead no there's a lot of overhead with selling into the us so if you've got a release and it's only a few hundred bottles um uh it's not going to be it's going to be miserable to do it in the us uh, I hate here, like you said, you know, your U.S. people hate hearing you say that because. Uh, so 2006 was not a four square vintage release because at that time we really had not established the vintage series. We didn't know that we would consistently do it. We, you know, it's easy now to look back at the success and assume that we knew everything. We did not know everything. And while I had always wanted to name the rums, I was um, not so brave yet. And so gave it a very conventional title of 2006. It was really a question of, um, yeah, it was just, I mean, it's, it wasn't even really named. It was just. How do you name it? year of distillation on it. It wasn't even a vintage. It wasn't even thought of as a vintage. It was just, it was, I mean, it was just what we did at the time, you know. How do you name the rums, Richard? So the, the 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 sometimes the name inspires the rum and the rum inspires the name. So like to give you an example, uh, like triptych was um, you know a blend of three different rums from three different oaks, and so you know uh, you know the three and the three made me think of you know the a triptych uh, you know. Uh, a piece of art to be enjoyed as one of three three elements as one so in you know detente was you know when we were sort of producing detente blending it it was so um you know the poor cast is always so uh, seductive and and uh, you sort of think well everyone will love this as in a broad audience and so you just think detente you know it means relax uh, agreement uh, you just so it really goes either in either direction. The the rum can inspire the name, or the name can inspire the rum. What about Nobilary? Yeah, so Nobilary was um, at the time. I think it was Nobilary. That was my oldest ex bourbon, and uh, again, it's a very big rum. Very, uh, you know, lots of wood and. And so we just felt it was a very majestic rum and uh, gave it that sort of royal title. And, and, and to give you another example, like Plenty Potenciario is a really big rum, very oily rum, very uh, powerful rum. And so you know, it was just like, you know, give it, you've got to give it a really powerful name or a name that means, you know, full power. So the first thinking was the English word, Plenty Potenciario, it's Plenty, plenty Potentiary. And then, of course, with the Valier series, we tend to use uh, Italian or Latin names. So then I, I did the Italian version, Plenty Potenziario. 
So going back to the really things we have in front of us. So, pat so patrimonial and hereditas. What I had decided to do that year was to do uh, two two runs that sort of you know because we were doing quite well with Foursquare, and I I did two runs patrimonial and hereditas, and the idea behind these two runs was these runs were a sort of a, a homage to to everyone that had come before to make them possible. So patrimony and, her and hereditas both mean inheritance, but they have a slightly different version on inheritance. So patrimonio is like a, um, uh, you know, patrimony is like a, 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 a good inheritance, a, a bountiful inheritance, and hereditas is like a burden. Is like, um, so hereditas, you have a burden to meet the standard. You have the burden to, to keep up with your, what your predecessors have done. So patrimonio is like you have a gift from your predecessors and hereditas is like you have a burden to meet the standards of your predecessors. So that's what we did with those two names. They came the same year. Yeah. So going back to the series, as you mentioned, Richard, you mentioned red and green series, um, but looking at the shibboleth and the hereditas, they're purplish in color. Is that like a... So, so what happened was, is when we decided on the word nobility, we decided that we could not write the word nobility in green because it was royal, and so we had to write the word nobility in, uh, in royal purple. Correct. And then when we did shibboleth, um, because shibboleth was all bourbon like nobility and was not uh, like Madeira or, or like all the other green series, we decided then to to do uh, shibboleth purple, like nobility. What about hereditas? So hereditas, well, that's the TWE private cast, so they get their own color. Okay, it looks very similar to mine. It is very similar, but it is, but it is their own color. So gotcha. all of the all of the TWE private casts are in that color. I didn't know that. Yeah. Very cool. So we're just starting to run out of time now. I can't believe two hours is almost up already. Dear God, time has flown by. It's been, Richard, a pleasure talking with you. Thank you so much for joining us, joining me today. And, you know, everyone watching and everyone listening and, you know, for all the interaction and the live stream and for the guys who watch the replay. Thank you so much for tuning in. Um, I am so grateful to all of you for watching. I love talking with spirits brands and it's always even more fun when you can go right to the source and talk to the producer um one of the last questions i'm going to throw up is drew asked what other rums besides foursquare and rl seal do you enjoy well and i have I'm a very ask what whiskey you enjoy i'm not a big whiskey fan um to be honest with you never have don't know why my other spirit that i like is uh, Calvados, which will probably maybe explain to you why I do use Calvados casts, even though Calvados casts are not primary, because I give them a special place. <laughs> uh, but other spirit, other than rums, well, um, I'm very close with my my Jamaican colleagues, um, so you know I usually when I'm hanging out with them, we're obviously either you know. If we're not drinking Barbados rum, we're certainly drinking Jamaican rum. Um, so Jamaican rum is probably the other rum that I, I drink probably the most. Obviously, I, I'm, as you say, we have a very close relationship with Hamden, as you probably would have guessed because of our partnership there. And, you know, Hamden is kind of a really, has a really special place in the rum world because it's, it's the one distillery that you can visit and you're going to see the rum making pretty well as you know, unchanged from the mid 18th century. So it's a very important distillery um, for Togo. anyone. So that's one. Hello, sweet pooch. Aww. Um, Drew again is asking fifthly what other brands, not just you know what other styles, but what brands you like other than your own. Well, that would be obviously in Campus Hamden and Worthy Park and Appleton. 
um, the Jamaicans. And on the probably on the French side, I'm a big fan of uh, Nissan. Um, and I'm a big fan of Gregory Grenard, who's a distiller at Nissan. I think he's one of the best distillers in our industry. Um, so he's certainly a guy I, I look to for advice and guidance. Um, yeah. Uh, Matt is saying, thank you for taking the time to share with us, Richard. He's a huge love of your rums. And Rio McCoy, three year is the well in Disneyland. That's marvelous. Dude. That is massive. Yeah. How does that well, feel, knowing your rum is the well in Disneyland? No, that's good. And that's kind of one of the reasons why we do the the, the, the partnerships that we do, because, it, you know, the, they'll get access to things we couldn't do on our own. But it does, that does remind me of, of one thing I, I, I do like to share is that it well, never yeah, gets old yours. when we see our rums all around the world. You know, it's, you know, I, you know, I've traveled to places like, you know, Hong Kong and Singapore and seen my bottles behind the bar and that feeling never gets old. You know, that feeling of, oh my God, my, my rum is here in a bar in Hong Kong. It's just, um, you know, if, if I told my grandfather, um, who I didn't know very well, I died when I was young, but if I told my grandfather that, you know, I was going to be selling rum in, in, in Singapore, you'd have thought I lost my mind. <laughs> All right, I have a really bizarre question for you. Something I've noticed on um, every, okay, so yeah, this is the right cork. Every cork, is there's a little slit in the cork. What's up with that? So one of the things that happens is when you cork the bottle, obviously there's a little bit of pressure. And so you can see it where sometimes after you open the bottle, the, the cork will rise. So the little slit is to try to release some of that pressure when 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 it's corked. Okay, I was wondering, but I'm like, is there like some kind of like thingy in the bottle, like in the actual like glass that like it like lock it like notches into and locks it in place? No, it's just to because with spirits, it's not like wine. We actually really want the cork to seal pretty tightly. But of course, when you make that action of sealing pretty tightly, you create a little pressure. And when you when you physically put it in, if you have that little slot, some mm -hmm. of the pressure will be relieved as the cork is going down before the cork finally sits in place. So the, the slit will will um, help that. So then you end up with a, with a you know nice tight cork, but not too much pressure to force it back out. Because we we have had customers before we put the slit in say. I mean, and some some of them have sent me videos where where the, where the cork sort of slowly rises and it doesn't pop right out but it, it does rise and um i say well that's um that's our special marketing device to encourage you to drink it um uh, it's but, uh, getting close to 100 degrees here in los angeles recently wow and i had so many bottles in my trunk last night and i was grateful that when i walked back in this morning to drive my car into my recording space uh, that they weren't popped open, but also grateful that I didn't store them on the side. They were stored straight up. Yeah. Yeah. And so what, that's one of the negatives too, is that sometimes when people buy the bottles shipped, you know, uh, spirit bottles are supposed to be upright. And then when they get shipping, they go on their side. And if the corks moved a bit, they can leak. So it's very annoying if you buy, especially you pay a lot of money. So the little, the slot there won't be in all of them. It'll be in the recent ones. I don't think you'll see the slot. You won't see the slot in Empery. You see it in Shibboleth. The Empery? Yeah. You wouldn't see the slot. No slot? No. You'll see it in Shibboleth, though. Would there be a slot in the McCoys? Um, I can't remember. I think they do. This cork doesn't have it, but it's possible that the cork had been replaced. Yeah. Um, now, we do only have a few minutes left, and I do really want to talk about Barbadian GI. Okay. Um, but also the Velier 2013 release that I have here. Right. Let's talk about GI first. Um, you are obviously a big proponent to, for creating a GI, Geographic Indicator, I think is the official, you know, non-acronated acronated 
abbreviate no acronym yeah acronated sure i'm making that word up probably <laughs> um so can you talk to us a little bit about well let's 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 take video. a little let's take a little step back so one of the things you might hear one of these sort of really false statements you might hear is you know run doesn't have any rules uh, or, you know, one version of that is when you hear something like, oh, well, the, the rules and age statements are different for run. This is all nonsense. Uh, when you sell a run in, for example, the U.S., where GIs are not recognized, so it won't be even solving the problem there. But when you sell a run in the U.S., you sell it under the TTB's rule for run. So Jamaica could have a rule, which they do. They have a law. You must not add sugar to Jamaica rum. But if you sell rum in Jamaica, but sell Jamaica rum in the United States, you could put sugar in it. You could put flavoring in it, which is all illegal in Jamaica because the Jamaica rules do not apply in the United States. That's the United ridiculous. They need to. Sorry? I'm saying it's ridiculous they don't. They absolutely shouldn't need to apply here. Sorry? They should. They should. I'm agreeing. I'm yeah, saying yeah. that so, it's ridiculous they do not but apply with, here. With Scotch whiskey or cognac brandy, for example, the TTB does recognize the rules. So yeah. when a bottle of Scotch whiskey is sold in the United States, if you look on your TTB website, you will see that the category called Scotch whiskey, you will see it says follows the rules of the United Kingdom. And if you look at the TTB uh, for Irish whiskey, it um, says, you know, follow the rules of Ireland. And if you read uh, Cognac Brandy, follows the rules of France. No such thing exists for Barbados to Jamaica. Uh, and then the rule of the age statements, of course, is nonsense because, yes, there may be a country, and there are countries in the rum world, as they are in the whiskey world, that says, you know, an age statement could be an average or a percentage or whatever. But the TDB doesn't allow that. The TDB says an age statement must be the youngest. So the thing about GIs is, is to get, to establish it in, at home, in your home country, and then you go around to countries that recognize GIs and you say, enforce my rules. So what it would mean is, is that a bottle of Jamaica rum or a bottle of Barbados rum sold, say in Europe, would have to respect the rules established back in Jamaica or back in Barbados. As is the case for Scotch whiskey all around the world or cognac all around the world or Champagne. Now, what would happen in a country like the U.S., which doesn't recognize GIs? It's a much more challenging. We'd have to go to the TDB and say, create a new identity, create a Barbados rum identity. Now, that's very unlikely. But what would happen uh, is that the bottles of rum from Barbados or Jamaica that met the GI, they would carry a certifying mark. Now, I'm going to use a bad example for my American friends, but I'm sure all my American friends, when you know when you go and you buy Cuban cigars around the world, you see the little certifying mark says Cuba. And that's what we're talking about. So what would happen is, so while, the, you know, we couldn't prevent someone selling a doctor, because in the TTB rules on rum, you can add 2.5% flavoring to rum. So you couldn't stop someone selling Dr. Jamaica rum in the United States, even if you had a GI, the difference would be is you as a consumer would be able to go to the shelf and see which bottles of Jamaica rum or Barbados rum carried the certifying mark. And then once you saw that, gotcha. you would know that meets the standard. So that's what we're after. That is something that's been basically denied to rum because we are small. We don't have big, you know, historically big export industries. 
rum is not a big homegrown industry in the United States or in Europe. So therefore, there's never been a homegrown movement. That's it, there's a lot of whiskey produced in the world that will, will never be legally allowed to be imported in America or Europe because it doesn't meet the standards. We don't have that protection with rum. You see, that's the difference. How rum. do we, as rum aficionados, rum nerds, rum drinkers, rum enthusiasts, help producers like yourself get that GI? Very difficult, very difficult, very difficult. <laughs> um, certainly, it's, so it's a chicken and egg situation because once we get the GI, it's easier for you because then you as a, you know, if you're a sommelier, you run a bar, you can say, well, you know what, I'm only going to buy certified runs. But of course, we have to get the certification before you can help us select, yeah. you know. So it's, it's, it's that catch-22, which is why there are forces outside trying to stop this because there are business interests outside of the region that are very happy to have weak standards for rum. There, there are people outside that, you know, don't want you to know that, you know, Captain Morgan's spice rum is not really rum. What is it? What's well, a spice rum? It's a flavored rum. Oh, but spice. There's lots of okay. people drinking it. They just think they're drinking rum. Yeah. I mean, I don't want to call too I mean, many different brand sense. names, but, but they're, they're, they're products in the U.S. market. Name. They're products in the U.S. market right now that claim they're Barbados rum. They're flavored. They're sweetened. They're doctored. They don't taste anything like Barbados rum. But they're using all of the provenance and reputation and history to sell their product without meeting the standard. And it's not in their interest. It's not in their interest for Barbados to take away that ability for them to use the word Barbados. Because the thing about a GI, GI doesn't stop anything. All the GI does is a standard of identity. So if you think, for example, if you have a product out there and it's you make it with Barbados distillate and you think aging it in Kentucky is great and you like to put banana flavoring with it and sugar and you think it's a wonderful product, if it still meets the TTB definition of rum, you can still call it rum. Uh, but if Barbados and Jamaica say, no, look, to carry this certification, you have to be the standard, then you'll let, you can't get a certification. So, of course those interests don't want it. Gotcha. Well, Richard, so, thank you so much for going through that. We are just... Yeah, like the people, there are people who think fireballs are whiskey. I was not going to throw that up, but um, since you brought it up, people think fireball is whiskey. Technically speaking, based off the definition of Canadian whiskey... Fireball is whiskey, based off of the definition of Canadian whiskey. Exactly. Because Canada allows flavoring and coloring to be added. Exactly. So we want, yeah. So, and so this is all, and of course, if you want your spirit, which we do, Barbados and Jamaicans, we want our spirit to, to compete against the best spirits in the world. We think, we think our rums can compete against anything. So we want to protect that. I can get because behind it, that, Richard. Uh, I'll, I'll, make, I'll make one last point on it. I'll make one Go last ahead. point on it. You, you're in control of your own brand, okay? So you promote all the attributes of your brand. But the strength of your brand still lives and dies on the strength of your category. So there, there, there is... So you, you wear two hats. You wear your brand hat and you talk about your brand and your promotion of your brand and, you, and the, the attributes of your brand. But you need also to protect your category. And so when you look at a Scotch whiskey brand, for example, or a bourbon uh, brand, those brands will tend to believe all of their success is from their own efforts. But they have, they have got where they are 
because they sit on the shoulders of their category. So as successful as a Scotch whiskey brand is or a bourbon brand, part of their success as a brand has been given to them by the success of their category. And this is why the most successful brands and the most successful categories are the ones that are best protected. This is not anything novel. You know, the greatest categories, whether it's, you know, Bordeaux or Champagne or Bourbon or Cognac or Scotch whiskey, they are done based on giving the consumer something they can trust and believe in. And I fully support that for Scotch whiskey, for Barbados rum, for Jamaica rum, or any category. I fully believe and support that. GIs are important and you know it should be up to the producers who are you know making let's just call it an adulterated product product that is and you know not quite going into as deep as you are but well, your adulteration you know yeah, yeah. well what the culture of the product is so, yeah. as I say, so the identity of Scotch whiskey can can have a sherry cast, but the identity of a bourbon whiskey wouldn't. That's because that's the history and culture of those categories. And that's what you want to Although, protect. In terms of bourbon whiskey, I personally, I think I disagree with you there. I have to analyze and think about that more. But I don't see a problem with bourbon innovating and, in the future and allowing, you know, finishing cask or secondary maturation even in separate casks i personally well, am not uh, if you will again and and the, the, and the, and I'm the, not personally a, per, the, i'm not a drinker i'm not a fan of flavored sugared product you right. know but and but the broader question is that that will be a, a decision of the category so so you know the category can make the changes that it wants to make so Things can change, innovations can happen, um, but you need to do them within a framework of being very careful about these steps and not just having yes. a free-for-all from the outset and taking whatever step or whatever change you make, taking it under great consideration and taking it with the, you know, the input of the producers and really making sure, because once you let the cat out of the bag with something, it's you know that's it so you need to go really with great caution and and the and that's the success of the best spirits the best spirits are the ones who you know take these things with with, with the greatest of care and caution before they just rush off and you know put things in strange barrels and um, allow strange strange things to happen we are on the same page i feel like we're on the same page we both want what is best for obviously Barbados from Jamaican rum, but at the spirits industry as a whole, we want the producers who are making, you know, spirit in the authentic style of the origin country to be able to say, well, look, we are authentic. We are making it, you know, in terms of mezcal, let's say, ancestral mezcal. Um, we're making it, you know, like our ancestors did and their ancestors before them. Um, so, you know, yes, you've got to be careful. Bourbon can't just go and suddenly authorize sherry casts. Then you have a mess on your hands. Yeah. But, you know, it's a, a process and slow and steady wins the race. Richard, we are just out of time. I appreciate you greatly for coming on. Thank you for your time. Thank you for making delicious rum. And thank you for educating me. You know, one of the things I knew that was going to happen today was be like, all right, I'm going to walk away with a different understanding and a slightly better understanding of rum, having spoken to a true master of rum. Um, for folks who want to reach out to you and get in touch with you, what's the best way to reach you? Uh, best way really is um, uh, befriend me on Facebook so you can follow the posts. You know, as they message me, um, there's a Facebook Appreciation Society, which is not an official page. It's not we established, the fans established it, but it's a great way to to talk about Foursquare Rums or ask questions. 
so that's a Facebook group. As I say, I, I'm not an admin. It's it's a totally independent, but I am there, and and it's proved a great place for exchanging information. Beautiful. Well, I'm going to raise the last a little bit of shibboleth left to you. Cheers. And know we will talk again very soon. Richard, thank you for your time. Thank you. Cheers, everybody.